and um, thanks to everybody who's um, you know uh, invited me here and given me this ovation. It's a great honor. Uh, but before I begin, uh, before you start the timer, um, honestly, it's a it's a great meeting. And Vimal and your entire team, congratulations! And you know, one more round of applause. Uh, it's just everything's working out perfectly. So that's that's great. All right, so today we, uh, uh, I'm going to do the, um, or deliver the Dr. S.K. Bhalla oration, which uh, the title initially was Evolution of HRCT, a 23 years journey. And I'm going to tell you why that title needs to be changed a little bit. A little bit about Dr. Bhalla, <coughs> um, 1929 to 2004. He started studying in Lahore in Pakistan and then moved to Vizag after partition, did the ND anesthesia from Delhi University, then became a cardiac anesthetist, uh, was in the Air Forces, became Air Marshal, and then once he left from there, joined Gangaram Hospital and has been a pioneer of cardiothoracic anesthesia in India a great teacher, highly revered anesthetist, and has left behind an enviable legacy uh, for everybody. And I stand in his shoes here, and it is an honor to be delivering uh, this oration. And I bring this slide again, because when Bimal asked me for a topic, I kind of calculated and counted the number of years I've been doing HRCT, and I thought it was 23, I don't know. I thought I was, I must have been smoking something, because I shaved 10 years of my life. It's actually a 33 years journey that started in 1991. And I have no idea why I, I told him 23 instead of 33. <clears throat> this is a pyramid that talks about how data becomes information, becomes knowledge, and then wisdom. And I'm going to use this to try and talk about my journey, but also talk about where we seem to be headed uh, with all of this. So data and information are quite simple. If we follow this protocol, we get great quality images. The images that we have are data and information. The history and examination are information. The articles and books and websites we read and learn, learn from are information. The knowledge that we get from this information allows us to say that this is the UIP pattern. And because the patient has rheumatoid arthritis, when we say that it's RAILD and not IPF, that is also knowledge that we assimilate from the information that this is a 50-year-old, 54-year-old lady with rheumatoid arthritis. Mentioning this appropriately in the report is wisdom. If we just say there's a fibrosing ILD and leave it at that, all we've done is provided information in the report. But saying that this is likely a UIP pattern and given the history of rheumatoid arthritis consistent with RA ILD, that is the understanding and wisdom related to the disease process that we're adding to the report. If the patient does not have rheumatoid arthritis, but knowing that this is a 54 years old who likely therefore has connective tissue disease, mentioning that this is likely CTD, ILD, and we should investigate for connective tissue disease is wisdom. So for a long time, data, information, and knowledge were our domain, right? Nobody had access to that. But that's changed, and we had an entire session on AI to do this. So I did that. I put these nine images in chat GPT. I asked it, what do you think is happening here? It told me that there's fibrosis and likely IPF because it assumed that it's the UIP pattern. So it used the data. It has the knowledge. Then I said, this is a 50-year-old, 54-year-old with RA. So it said immediately, this is RA ILD. So again, it had the knowledge to give me this. But when I asked chat GPT that what if this patient didn't have RA, then it just gave me, this, gave me this boilerplate of things to do, which means it's still generating information but does not have the wisdom to know what exactly to do in that patient with that information. There is no premium now on data, information, or knowledge, because it's so widely available 
to everyone, including patients. Our strength in the end has to be wisdom because data information knowledge are just easily available. It doesn't change the fact that we still need to learn and absorb information and gain knowledge. That's a given, that's the bedrock. But we don't need to mug. We don't need to know the entire Langrad's chart by heart, which perhaps 10, 15 years ago we would need to. We just need to know where it is on our phone, on our iPads, laptops, or a chart that is you know, pinned to the wall that you can refer to within 10 seconds. That's what we need to know. We don't need that mugged up knowledge inside, but we need to understand what to do with the information and knowledge and how to apply it to our day-to-day -day work with understanding and wisdom. The best doctors over the last 100, 150 years have always understood this intuitively. And there is no other way now, because now that data information and knowledge are easily available, we also need to have that. And on that bedrock, we need to develop understanding and wisdom. So with all that gyan, let's see how all that has evolved over the last 33 years. There was a time. Um, how many of you are, um, were born after 1991? Jesus Christ. There was one scarcity of data and information. I'm sounding like, you know, once upon a time in the bad old days, we didn't have anything to eat, nothing to drink. That's what it's coming to. So the first CT scanners were installed in 1979 and 1980. And though um, there were more head scanners, there used to be only head scanners for a long period of time. Um, that was even in the mid-70s in India. So it was about 45 years ago. For a lot of you who have an interest in the business of radiology, the country's largest medical imaging chain which still hasn't been surpassed, was something called the United Group that put up about 50 or 54 second generation Toshiba machines across the country. It was a business deal. There was a lot of fraud involved uh, based on some Indo-Japanese stuff. But they did put these up. And a whole generation of radiologists, including Dr. Bakshi in Delhi, Dr. Srinivas Desai, Dr. Indar Talwar, all these people who are now in their late 60s, early 70s, cut their teeth on these machines, became our teachers, and then you know, ran hospitals, you as well, right? and Chidu as well. The main use of all these, so see how old he is, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the main use of all these scanners was head imaging, followed by chest and abdominal. And all we had were films, right? There were no workstations, computers. We had eight by 10 films, the ones you use for ultrasound today. So imagine a CT with 100 images. You had about 20 films. You put them on view boxes, and then you looked at them. And then when 14, 17 films came in, we said, wow, what a revolution. Now you can have 20 images instead of having those 8 by 10s. And it was, it was a big thing at that time. That's part of that hype cycle, right? Something new comes. You think it's going to revolutionize stuff. But data, therefore, was cocooned in the silos of the imaging centers. And the information could only be passed on via, via films and the printed reports. And because the onus of uh, maintaining records in India has always been on the patient, the centers would never keep the data. It was the patient who had to carry these films and reports from one place to another and store them at home. So there was a lot of restriction to the use of data. So I was a resident in LTMMC, LTMGH in 1988, 36 years ago. All we had were x-rays, ultrasound, and fluoro, no CT or MR. The first CT came in 1992. We had no easy access to English music, Hollywood movies. We had cassettes and CDs. Uh, you know, if uh, people from abroad came with Kit Kat chocolate, we thought they were very nice relatives from abroad. And the only cars were ambassadors, you know, don't think we didn't have a life, all of you 80% who were born after 91. It was still a good life, but this is what I'm saying. And Dilwale Dulanya uh, was seven years away. These were the super hit movies from that time. And day before yesterday, I had another revelatory mo um, uh, moment. So I have a fellow with me who's about 30 years old. 
And I had this patient um, with the last name Bokadia. And if anyone remembers, Casey Bokadia was a producer in those times and he did a bunch of Amitabh movies, including things like Ganga Jamna Saraswati, which all then flopped and stuff like that. And then they lost money. And I said, you know, this must be part of the same clan because they all live in Girgaon in Mumbai, where my practice is. And then I said, but you know, Manmohan Desa used to live just across the road. And you know, he directed Amar Akbar Anthony. And I had this blank look. This guy had never heard of Amar Akbar Anthony. And so my question is, how many of you have heard of Amar Akbar Anthony? At least some of you have. But he never had. Right? And then he looks at me just to make me feel good and says, but I have seen Shole. And I'm like, very nice. But he still didn't know that the director was Ramesh Sippi or whatever. But I'm just saying that's how things have changed. And this is where we were at that point in time. This incidentally was Satya. This is Kamalasan in his uh, movie where he kills everybody. So there was no internet, no Wi-Fi, no cell phones, but we survived. We did very well. As an intern in 88, our job was to escort patients with head injuries and strokes to nearby scan centers for head scans and the rare chest or abdominal scan. And then once I became a resident, our big job was two in the morning do um, uh, direct carotid angios for head injuries to figure out whether the patient had subdurals or extradurals, right? And the interesting thing was that, you know, the patient was drunk, the tech was drunk, uh, the ward boy was drunk. Sometimes your registrar was drunk if you were a houseman. It was a challenge doing all of these things, but we still managed to you know, put a catheter inside the carotid pump contrast and you know, take three cassettes with films, uh, get some images in the dark room and figure out what to do with the patient. I joined Bombay Hospital in 91 as a senior resident. And that was the first time, the second machine in India, I think the first was an All India Institute, we had a one millimeter slice scanner called the Siemens Hi-Q uh, with a high resolution algorithm. And so for the first time in the country, we were able to do lung imaging along with temporal bone and PNS CT. And though I don't do head and neck for a few, for a few years, I used to also give talks on temporal bone CT and I still don't know how I did that. Within a year, we busted the myth that sarcoidosis doesn't occur in India except in Kolkata Marwadis, right? This was the thing that we had. For some reason, Marwadis who lived in Kolkata got sarcoid simply because there were doctors there who knew how to diagnose sarcoid and they were able to do that. But it didn't occur anywhere else. And, you know, there was the other myth that multiple sclerosis doesn't occur in India until when the first MRIs came in 87 and people started seeing typical multiple sclerosis um, images, suddenly everyone realized that people with MS were being mistaken for something else because the country's doctors had deluded themselves into believing the disease doesn't exist. The same thing used to happen with sarcoid, the same thing happened with pulmonary thromboembolism. Till we had spiral CT in 97, 98, till 97, 98. The country believed that pulmonary thromboembolism doesn't occur in Indians unless they are fair-skinned and blue eyes. Just, you know, things like that. So we still do that with some diseases, but it's less. The internet started in 96, 97, but full-fledged services were only in the mid-2000s. And so until PubMed and online articles and journals came about, there was scarcity of information. So. We had scarcity of data because we didn't have ways of dissemination. And then we had scarcity of information. The only way we could learn was from articles in journals, but they came to our library six to nine months later after publication because they were sent by post. And the post came by ship. That was it. So it was what was called not air mail, but uh, 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 land mail, and land meant shipping, right, from the United States. It would take three to six months, and then the post office would deliver when it wanted to, and that's what basically happened. Then we had a couple conferences a year, or if somebody went to the RSNA, then that was fine as well. But we weren't too far away from being cutting it. So 85 was when Dr. Zaruni and Nadich published this paper, and then the HRCT paper was in 87. We had the machine by 91. And this was the third edition of the Webb Nadich Mueller book, which became a Bible. Because they had a bunch of images. 
So you could do pattern recognition. What AI does right now, we would take an image, then we would take the book, and we would say, what does this fit into? If it fits into, that's the diagnosis. That's how we learned, and we managed to you know, get ourselves trained. I started giving lectures, very basic ones. Um, we would you know, just talk about HRCT and you know, what it is, and what are the various diseases that you can see with it. Some of you might remember that we started using digital only in the late 90s, predominantly early 2000s. Until then, we had slides, 35 millimeters. They would be put in these Kodak uh, carousel trays. And as a speaker, I would carry the trays with me in cabin baggage. And then we hoped that the organizer in the conference had the Kodak trays. And then there would be double projection. So you had to synchronize the slides and make sure they ran the same way. And it worked. We did that for a long period of time. Until then, we were able to use PowerPoint. And, and suddenly, you know, it was one day this. And then within about three or six months, everybody transitioned from slides to digital presentations. There used to be one national conference, one midterm, a few state annual conferences. Most radiologists would attend two meetings a year. That's about it. REF was started in 96, essentially because there was a gap. And so we basically wanted to address this information and knowledge gap, which we did. And one of the reasons for SKI was that in one of the focus chest meetings, a bunch of people got together. Then there were a couple more other meetings. And then people just realized we need a society. So some of these things have generated from that, as is the Indian Academy of Cardiac Imaging. So we were generating data getting information, gathering knowledge about HRCT and diffuse lung diseases, but slowly, very slowly, because we did not have the information explosion we have now. And then along the way, we started getting some understanding and wisdom. Here's a 51-year-old, used to work in a samosa wrap factory with dyspnea and cough early 2000s. That's the radiograph, that's the CT. You have some confluent nodules, varying sizes. Here is the confluence into um, uh, opacities, and then you have eggshell calcification. So if I ask you what this is, it's pneumoconiosis, it's silicosis. So the data and information <coughs> give us the knowledge that this is silicosis. But the question, right, just mentioning this in the report is not enough. The question is, how did this person get silicosis? This person is not from Dunbar. The person has not worked in a coal mine. The person doesn't work in a sandblasting industry. How does a samosa wrap worker get silicosis? So the lecturer in KEM, uh, Mahima, she went to the place in Dharavi where the factory was, found that they were, you know, they had these bowls of sand that they used to adulterate the maida with, you know, the samosa flour. And the maida leaves were separated you know, it didn't have aluminum or plastic foil at that time, so you used to sprinkle a little sand to separate these out. And they were, they had these bowls of sand, um, you know, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, for many, many years that they were just inhaling. And then all the co-workers were dysnic. They managed to get a couple of them into KEM and work them up, etc. But that is uh, part of wisdom, asking the questions, following up on those, searching for answers, is when you make a difference. Anybody can say this is silicosis. How does that work or matter unless you figure out why this patient has it and then try and get an answer from that? It's like when you crack NEAT, right? It's all about absorbing data, information, and knowledge. It's mugging up stuff and getting some stuff into your brain and hoping that during the exam it comes out. It is only when you start seeing patients in residency that you start gaining some knowledge and some understanding of medicine, etc. And wisdom is what you start getting when you understand what is happening in the, with the patient and what needs to be done, which hopefully will continue to increase with accumulated knowledge. You know, wisdom doesn't come without knowledge. You still need data information knowledge for you to get wisdom. Information and knowledge do not make you a good doctor. Today, you have chat GPT for that. You don't need that, right? You just need to become a wise doctor faster to be a good doctor. So very often, knowledge is serendipitous, right? This 45-year-old man came with repeated pneumothoraces. We were at a loss. So you can see this was in 2009. 
to 15. I sent these images to Tom Hartman at the Mayo Clinic. He said, just call it idiopathic bullis disease. We don't know what it is. And we didn't know. Then, this is a mad kachi. I don't know, if, so I've said guju, but he's kachi. I don't know how many of you know kachis in your lives. He is completely crazy. He goes to Hawaii for scuba diving, gets a pneumothorax, airlifted to UCSF, biopsied, and they made a diagnosis of berthog dube syndrome, which meant two things. One, BHD occurs in India, and two, we had a diagnosis. Then, of course, his FLCN gene was done, came positive, but that gave us the wisdom to crack a case we were unable to since 2002. So this lady in 2002 had these cysts. It wasn't lamb because the cysts were of varying sizes. She had no features of tuberous sclerosis, etc. And we again didn't know what to do. Then two things happened. A first degree relative of hers in Canada had multiple pneumothoraces and they finally did the FLCN gene test and that came positive. We had information about this patient with the BHD syndrome. We put all of that together, got her FLCN gene test done, which was positive. So we finally became wise with all that knowledge we had gained, and we were able to make a diagnosis in her case. So things kept moving on, stuttering, etc. Then a big change that happened is CIPLA reverse engineered perfenidone and brought it to India and started selling it at some seven rupees a tablet or some ridiculous price like that. And suddenly, from being an orphan disease that even chest physicians would not want to touch because there's so much asthma, COPD, and TB work, there was a huge interest in diffuse lung diseases, especially IPF, and that created a snowball effect. So because there was interest, we also started learning more. The society came up, and you know a lot of that started happening. So more and more people started getting scanned, early pickup of disease, better triage of conditions, better understanding of management. That increased our knowledge and gave us more wisdom. Then with COVID-19, online meetings got a huge boost. Suddenly, information was democratized, right? Today, you have access to the finest lectures from the best speakers, often for free, right? So you, there is no premium on any of that. All of that is available, and you can pretty much uh, get whatever knowledge you want. So even REF has now, you know, we do these REF Cafe Rengen lectures four times a week. Uh, we've been doing them now for five years. And they work, but the idea now is to move away from just giving information to talking about wisdom, which means when a speaker says, how do I approach um, a case of a liver lesion? That is the wisdom being imparted by the speaker telling you how to approach, rather than telling you, okay, hepatoma, five signs, FNH, five signs. That doesn't work. I mean, that information you have from Radiopedia as well. So it is what to do when you are faced with a pathology that is the true understanding and wisdom. And that's the only thing that still commands a premium. 80-year-old on clopidogrel at hemoptysis, did a CT, found these interstitial lesions. Five years later, no change on the right, little progression on the left. He had COVID in September 21, but those COVID lesions have regressed. So you have interstitial fibrosis, apparently progressing. Patient is asymptomatic except for some sputum. What do you report and what do you say? That's the wisdom. We have the data, the information of an interstitial process. We have the knowledge this is interstitial lung disease. We need the wisdom to figure out what to say. Is it an interstitial lung abnormality? which we would say if the patient was asymptomatic? Is it an indeterminate interstitial lung disease, which we would say if the patient is symptomatic? All that needs to go into the report and communicate it to the referring doctor. And that is what will determine the patient's trajectory. And that is the wisdom that we need to develop. Many radiologists are still stuck in the data information and knowledge stage. And that is what needs to change. We cannot just be image readers. We need to be physicians and doctors. We did MBBS first and MD radiology later. By doing MBBS, we developed the ability, or we should have, but since you all anyway started studying for PG need from day one of MBBS, that doesn't work anymore. But you're ideally able to become a family physician and treat people the day you finish your internship. 
So you are a physician the day you finish your MBBS and you have the right and the ability to treat people. You became a radiologist later, you became an image reader later. And that's something we somehow tend to keep forgetting. We don't want to advise patients, we don't want to do any of that because for some reason we believe that radiologists are not really doctors, which is why we use the term clinician. So when we're sitting here, we'll say, the clinician referred a patient. I am a clinician also. When you say clinician, you're uh, uh, implying that you're not a clinician. Say referring doctor or physician or surgeon or whatever, but don't call somebody else a clinician implying that you're not, right? So that's the important thing. But if the eye does not know or see what the brain does not know, then it's pointless. And it comes back to the fact that you need to keep reading or listening to lectures till you hang up your boots or die with your boots on. I'll give you an example. 74-year-old, stable perivertebral uh, RT, you know, next to where radiation was given for multiple myeloma. The myeloma relapsed and then was given CAR T therapy, and here you've got all this organizing pneumonia, which seems to be worsening, but the patient wasn't clinically worsening. Anybody, what do you think this is? So this is an entity called radiation recall pneumonitis. That is lung injury occurring in the bed of a previously injured lung, either with, with chemotherapy in this case. But what if you've never heard of radiation recall pneumonitis? If you haven't, then nothing will help you get to that diagnosis. And the only way you would have heard of it is you've been reading up on current literature on what is happening in the field of diffuse lung diseases. So you need to be reading, et cetera, or listening to experts. Even Chad GPT didn't get it. It got the fact that there was post RT fibrosis. It got the fact that there's an organizing pneumonia pattern, but it didn't put two and two together, probably because it's not been trained to do this. And until I asked it that given the fact that there's radiation, et cetera, and all that, do you think you have an alternate diagnosis? Then it said it could be radiation recall pneumonitis. So let me go through this slide that I showed initially. You still need to learn and absorb information and gain knowledge. That does not change. The way to do it has changed. You don't need to mug up stuff. You just need to know where to access that information quickly whenever you need it. But more importantly, you need to know what to do with that information and knowledge in your day-to-day -day work and use it with understanding and wisdom. And the best doctors have always known how to do this intuitively. So the bedrock doesn't change. You still have to be very good at what you do and well-trained, but add another layer of wisdom on top of everything that you know. So that was my attempt today. And just to end, I'm still proud to be a radiologist, proud to be a doctor. And for me, you know, getting up in the morning gives me immense pleasure knowing that whatever I do today will hopefully for the good, not adversely, change the life of at least one patient or one person in this world, right? And that happens to all of us, for good or for bad, whatever we do. Um, and we need to realize that all our reports have correlates, right? There is an action reaction thing that happens. You cannot escape the consequences of what you report ever. Medical legally, you may not be liable, but ethically, you are always liable for the consequences of your action. Quick example, right? If you have a long segment lesion in the femur, which is a chondrosarcoma, but you report it as osteomyelitis and the orthopedic surgeon curettes it, spreads the chondrosarcoma and converts a potentially treatable into a hindquarter amputation. You are responsible, it's on your conscience, you screwed up. You cannot say that, you know, it's not my job, orthopedic surgeon should have also figured out what's going on. It doesn't work like that, right? So in some parts of radiology, the consequences are not that great. In some parts of radiology, like bone tumors, the consequences are immense. And you need to learn that, and that's, that's the important thing. But then if you've crossed that, you will positively impact the life of at least one individual every day. And how many professions in this world can say that? I'm 59, right? My non-medical friends have all retired. 
they wake up in the morning, they don't know what to do with their lives. And now all they do is send WhatsApp forwards and look at Instagram and waste their lives. They have another 30 years ahead of them and they don't know what to do with their lives. As a doctor, you're privileged, right? You can make a difference every single day of your life. That's what sets us apart from everybody. And you know, you're young, you may not realize it, but the older you get, and you see people around you who are not doctors, you know, struggling with a purpose in life, you'll realize that being a doctor gives you so much purpose for the rest of your life, right? So that's my evolution over 33 years doing lung imaging, 36 years doing radiology, 59 years on this earth. Put it another way, I have 1587 weeks and 11,108 days before I turn 90, which would probably be when I hang up my boots and maybe on that 90th, in that 90th year, I'll be standing in front of people saying evolution of lung imaging the last 63 years, right? If ski is still around and you know all of this is still there, I'm going to try and wrangle this particular lecture. Thank you so much for listening to me.